Hello, I'm John Brisson, author of Fix Your Gut Health Coach. Welcome to the Fix Your Gut YouTube channel. Today we are going to talk about the use of Zyfaxin, also known as Rifiximin, um, in the treatment of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndrome, also known as SIBO. Um, it's both pros and cons associated with its use. Um, now, Zyfaxin belongs to a class of antibiotics known as the uh, Rifamycin class of antibiotics. Um, and the rifamycin class of antibiotics are used usually to tackle very serious diseases uh, like um, um, uh, mycobacterium uh, infections that are you know, the cause of tu tuberculosis or mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis, which is the known cause of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, um, or uh, MRSA infections, you know, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so in, in SIBO with the form of Zyfaxin. So, you know, this class of antibiotics are used to treat very, very hardy bacteria and mycobacterium and very serious diseases. Um, and there's three antibiotics from this rifamycin class that we're going to talk about today, uh, which is uh, uh, rifapin, uh, rifabutin, and uh, rifaxin, which is uh, zyfaxin. Um, so each three of these antibiotics, um, they have their own pros and cons of whether or not I recommend um, their uses. Um, so rifapin, uh, was discovered in 1965, and around that time, um, these uh, antibiotics were discovered because um, they started synthesizing um, antimicrobial compounds from a bacteria known as Streptomyces uh, mediterranei, where now they actually produce most of the antibiotics from either the bacterium Amacoloptis uh, rifomycea, or it's artificially produced. Um, and you know, a lot of our antibiotics come from antimicrobial agents that both bacteria and yeast produce, um, and they, they kill other organisms, and that's how we use a lot of our modern medicine um, when it comes to antibiotics. So uh, the, the issue mainly with rifapin is, you know, it has a standard side effects that most antibiotics do, like nausea and uh, stomach upset stomach and, and, and diarrhea and vomiting which all that can be uh, from microbiome changes um, from you know reducing a probiotic microbiome in the digestive tract and most antibiotics if not all of them cause that to a certain degree and a loss of appetite too as well um, and you know it, this antibiotic does also have the standard like allergic reactions and rashes that can occur too that's pretty standard it has two unique side effects associated with its use. One being benign, which is it turns the urine, sweat, and tears to a red and orange color, because rifap, uh, rifapin itself is that kind of rusty orange kind of color. Um, so it can't, and that might be alarming, you know, you go use the bathroom and you're, you're in there getting red, orangish, you know, thinking it's blood, but it's, it's just the antibiotic. And that actually is pretty benign. Uh, but the second side effect is associated with its use is pretty major, which is hepatotoxicity or liver damage. Uh, so when you are on this medication, if you take it, I usually don't recommend it unless it's a life or death situation where it's needed to be used. Um, I would recommend that you, you know, your doctor monitors your liver levels to make sure that your liver is not being uh, too damaged from the medication. Um, and that you also supplement um, ubiquinol and PQQ uh, because it seems to be the liver damage seems to be mitochondrial, uh, it seems to come from mitochondrial oxidative stress uh, caused by the liver uh, from taking, from the liver detoxifying and, and, and from, from the medication. Um, so yeah, I would definitely uh, recommend um, that you, that uh, if you, if you do take rifampin that you do protect your liver. Um, by uh, increasing mitochondrial function, by increasing ubiquinol and PQQ, by ubiquinol and PQQ supplementation, um, because uh, rifampin is processed by the liver and it can harm the liver mitochondria. Um, the second antibiotic, which is a lot safer and doesn't necessarily have or associated with um, as strong liver toxicity issues, and it was approved in the United States for medical use in 1992, is the antibiotic known as rifabutin. Uh, now, rifabutin, of course, has standard side effects associated with its use that you would get with um, any type of antibiotic that changes the microbiome, like I mentioned earlier, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, it can cause systemic allergic reactions like rashes or maybe headaches. Um, but it does have other side effects associated with its use, too. Like it can reduce the function of the immune system by lowering uh, neutrophils um, within the blood levels, um, as well as it can cause muscle pains 
and also has been known to cause uveitis. That being said, mycobacterium infections cause uveitis anyway. So there's a possibility if you have mycobacterium in the UV of your eye and you take this antibiotic, the die-off is going to cause uveitis. So I don't know if it's specifically that the antibiotic rifibutin causes uveitis, or it's just a die-off from the bacteria, mycobacterium themselves within the UV of the eye. Uh, but yes, rifibutin is now recommended as the frontline treatment for tuberculosis instead of uh, rifampicin. Um, and it is used um, in people with severe ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and you've got to reduce the mycobacterium avian complex that's in their microbiome that they're dealing with. Um, it is part of anti mat therapy. It is used for that, and, and I do recommend its use in cases that are severe enough. Um, so yes, I, I do recommend uh, rifibutin's use um, over uh, rifampicin for sure. It tends to be safer, um, and I would still recommend to as well. Um, the, it is still metabolized the liver. You still protect um, the mitochondria of your liver by taking uh, ubiquinol or PQQ uh, when you use uh, rifibutin. Um, but unlike other antibiotics like ciprofloxin or, or levaquin, you know, fluoroquinolones, um, or uh, erythromycin or azithromycin, most macrolides, um, it doesn't seem to affect the whole body's mitochondria. It seems to primarily target the liver for oxidative stress. It doesn't affect the heart that I know of. Uh, yet through studies or anything like that, it doesn't affect the brain. It doesn't affect the muscle tendings that you normally have with fluoroquinolone, what they call being floxed. Um, but, you know, supplementing with magnesium and you know, protecting your mitochondria and everything. You know, following a um, uh, Cipro protocol, I have a blog when you're doing rifibutin or definitely when you're doing um, uh, rifo, uh, rif rif rifamampsin, I definitely would recommend it for that. Rifibutin, it's up, it's up, it's up to your own discretion. Um, now, the third antibiotic is the one that is used for specifically small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndrome, and that antibiotic is known as Zyfaxin, um, also known as Rifaximin. Um, now, this one is a little bit different than the other ones. Uh, it is primarily only used for SIBO. It was used before that for traveler's diarrhea, as well as hepatic encephalopathy. Um, it has very poor systemic absorption, meaning that it only... Is it only is active mainly in the end of the duodenum and the gingium and the ileum, and it's not really past that, and we'll explain why in a minute. So unlike rifabutin and rif rifampicin, you can't use it systemically. It only works for the most part within the small intestine. Um, so, and the reason being is because it requires bile to be soluble and activated, unlike the other bacteria, uh, or another bacteria, I mean, other antibiotics. So, it bile is you know expressed by the liver or, or the gallbladder. It's expressed by the liver and installed in the gallbladder and released by the gallbladder. If you don't have gallbladder, it's dump, directly dumped by the liver into the duodenum, um, and it, it is res absorbed back at the end by the end of the ileum through hepatic uh, circulation. Most of it. Some of it is is released in, in defecation, but not much. Most of it, most bile is recirculated. Um, so Zyfaxin, it's only active when it's in, it's only soluble when it's exposed to bile. So by the end of the ileum and the beginning of the cecum, there's very little bile, if any at all. So Zyfaxin becomes inactivated. And so does it affect the colonic uh, microbiome. So it makes it work very well for hydrogen dominant and mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis that's within, you know, hydrogen dominant bacteria and mycobacterium that is in the ileum and the gingium of the small intestine. It works very well for that. But outside of that, the colon, the stomach, the rest of your body, your lungs, it doesn't do anything. It, it, it doesn't affect that. So for SIBO, and for people who, you know, not all sort of clients so much, but maybe if they have Crohn's disease, let's say they have a mycobacterium dysbiosis of the ileum, you see that a lot in Crohn's disease. Um, Zyfaxin will work very well, very, very well for that um, in most cases. And, it, and so I do recommend it for SIBO and for mycobacterium dysbiosis that's in the ileum, in the gingium. Um, for people with, uh, with Crohn's disease, but not really so much for ulcerative colitis, where the MAP tends to be outside of the ileum and more into the colon. So it, it, that, that usually is how you know how it works. So if you don't produce a lot of bile, and your stool is generally very 
clay colored or if you have a bacterial overgrowth that can break down bile or, or even ingest it. Um, Cyfaxin may not work well. It may not work well at all because it doesn't have enough bile to become activated. Now, some people have theorized that you could take an oxbow supplement and that would activate the Cyfaxin. There's no studies on that. That's only theory, but it may work. Um, so yeah, the pros for Cyfaxin are that it works extremely well, for hydrogen-based bacteria, for people with SIBO, based with hydrogen. And it works well for mycobacterium and, and, and dysbiosis of the ileum and the gingium. And it doesn't cause many systemic side effects, again, because it is not very well absorbed it's all outside of the intestinal tract. It doesn't affect the flora of the colon. It doesn't affect the flora of the rest of the body and, and large impact. Um, it doesn't cause liver toxicity. Um... There, there's a low chance of bacteria acquiring antibiotic resistance because it inhibits bacterial RNA, uh, which most of the um, medications within the rifamycin family do, antibiotics. Um, and, and so there's, it's pretty good. I mean, it, it, the another two drawbacks, I guess, to say is that is this. Not every bacteria is weak to Zyfaxin. And if you just do Zyfaxin by itself for your hydrogen dominant sibling, so you do nothing else, you don't rebuild the microbiome with prebiotics, uh, you don't take, change your diet, you don't change your sleep hygiene, you don't change your vitamin D intake through the sun, if you just do Zyfaxin alone, studies have shown that more than likely your SIBO will come back. Um, it will renew itself. So it has to be in use conjunction with other supplements and making sure your motility is good and making other lifestyle changes. Usually if you do it, use it by itself as it's prescribed, um, it doesn't seem to work very well as far as preventing a reoccurrence. And it may help bring your symptoms down for the 10 or 14 days that you take it while you're on the Zyfaxin. But after that, most people have SIBO flare-ups within a couple of months that come back. Um, and uh, it doesn't work very well against SIBO with constipation, even though it does reduce hydrogen it doesn't affect archaea, which produce methane. So with SIBO with constipation or SIBO with methane dominant, methane dominant SIBO, uh, the archaea, they're, they're different organisms. So Zyfaxin does not work against them. So it mainly is only used for hydrogen dominant SIBO, which is mainly SIBO that, causes, that comes with diarrhea. Um, so yeah, you have to make sure that Zyfaxin, when used properly, it can be an important treatment option to help your fight against SIBO. Um, and you need to talk with your gastroenterologist using information that you've learned from this video and from my blog on Zyfaxin 2 to make a proper determination if Zyfaxin is right for you. If you are dealing with hydrogen dominant SIBO or um, Crohn's disease, uh, mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis infection of, or dysbiosis of the ileum and the gingium of the small intestine. Um, if you have ulcerative colitis or if the MAP is, you know, affection is somewhere else in your body, then the use of rifabutin may be needed if it's severe enough over Zyfaxin. Um, but yes, I do recommend the use of Zyfaxin uh, for hydrogen-based SIBO uh, when, it's, when it's needed and when it is done properly. Um, I hope you found this video informative. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.